okay well it, it says it's recording but uh so i'm assuming you guys can see my slides what i'm sharing yes we can yes we're yep. Okay, let's get going then. Uh, okay, welcome uh, everyone. So this is our second um, auth inter meeting. Um, so that this is the not well. As a reminder, this applies here too. Um, note taker, uh, Jared, thank you, thank you for for taking the notes for us this time too. I appreciate appreciate that. Done that last time. That was great. Uh, so the meeting today will be uh, focused on nested jot and, and jot profile for access tokens. But uh, as a reminder, we still have um, four more meetings to go, and, and this is uh, the full list here. So, and we will be meeting uh, every uh, Monday, uh, the next four Mondays. So this uh, the agenda for the meeting today is uh, nested jot and. Uh, Got a profile for access tokens, and uh, I will get started. So hopefully, it will be my presentation uh, first. Before I start, uh, uh, any any comments, questions, any agenda bashing? Okay. So um, I'm expecting my slides, my presentation to be kind of quick. So I so we give them. Um, uh, or you uh, more more than half an hour, so hopefully we will get there. Okay, so um, nested jot. We've we've talked about this a few times already. Um, so this uh, hopefully this time we will make uh, some progress with this. So um, seventy five nineteen um, defines the concept of uh, of jot, and inside that there is a the concept of a nested jot. So the concept of a nested jot is just a jot that has a payload as another jot. So the, uh, that, that concept that defines that RFC has uh, uh, some limitation, and that limitation uh, is related to the fact that the enclosing jot, the outer jot, uh, doesn't have its own um, claims. It, it only contains the, the enclosed jot. So the goal of this simple draft is really to extend that scope, meaning that we want the own, also the enclosing jot to have its own claims beside that whatever uh, the nested jot itself. So there are three uh, three use cases. I think we've talked about two of them in the past, and we add another one uh, that was. Uh, uh, we'll talk about this in a second. So the, the first one is a native app use case. In this case, we have a native app, a app that needs access to two different services, a telephony service controlled by an, an authorization server and a non-telephony service that is um, controlled by an open ID provider. And the native app is aware of the authorization server only, it's not aware of that um, uh, open ID uh, provider. So that the flow starts with the native app launching a browser uh, to allow the user to authenticate itself. The browser calls the um, authorization server, which redirects it to the open ID um, provider. The user authenticates and a code is um, um, provided. Uh, that code will be then uh, move, uh, provided to the native app. The native app will then uh, use that code to contact the authorization server. Will which will then um, exchange that author, uh, code for a token from the OP uh, um, provider, and then um, create its own token and, uh, and embed that uh, OP token inside the, uh, the, the token provided by the authorization server, and then send it back to, to the application. The application will be able to validate the outer token, which was provided by the uh, authorization server, and then act upon it and be able to extract the nested token and act upon it. So the, the second use case is a STIR use case. If you're familiar with STIRs, this is a, a mechanism to address uh, 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 robocalls and, and problems with the incoming calls that um, uh, you can fake the, the number associated with that call. Um, so, um, the flow in that case, you have a, a, a is calling B with a, a jot. That jot is just a, 
uh, they call it a passport, but it's a, a job that contains the the number that uh, to validate that this whoever make made that call actually owns that number. So A calls B. Um, A's call is retargeted to C, so that the service that re does the retargeting will create a, a yet another a, a jot and it will uh, have information about the retargeting and then send that uh, and embed the original uh, jot inside the new token and and new jot and send uh, send that the new nested jot to the uh, to the new target which is c and in this case c will be able to see that the call the original call was between a uh, was targeted to a to b and it was retargeted to C. So that's the second uh, use case. Uh, Rifat, Rifat um, yep. going back to the store use case, I think you should mention uh, to folks on the call who are not familiar with this type of work that this is a, a, a quite important development to fight against robocalls. Um, yes. An IDF effort to, like if robocalls showed up in, in telemarketing, but also in, uh, um, in SWAT, in SWATting, uh, these are emergency calls that are placed, um, sort of fraudulent emergency calls and so on. So, uh -huh. yep. and they happen, the, the group decided to use JWTs. So JWTs have found their way uh, into other domains as well, besides uh, the classical OAuth use cases. It's maybe, maybe also worth noting though that the, there's a draft for this exact thing, and they have defined their own claim um, to carry the the nested passport job. This was uh, this was based in exactly on that draft, and it, it's I think the draft is called passport extension for the vetted calls, right? Uh, and, yeah, and I was, yes. And I was trying to get them to to use uh, kind of this you no know, mechanism, but it was a little bit too late because I think that the draft is already in with the ISG. So, so we'll see. I, I it might be too late for that, but yeah. But anyway, it's it's based on exactly that that use case. That's the use case that I'm describing here, right? Okay. Thank you. So the the third use case is that. Um, uh, Somebody from the uh, open source um, project called the Network Service Mesh. Um, they're working on on um, uh, a project that's similar to uh, that trying to emulate what uh, Service Mesh is, is doing, but it's for layer two and layer three. If if you're familiar with STO, so they are trying to to do something like STO but for lower layers. So in in their case, uh, they have. Um, a bunch of intermediaries and those NSM messages will pass through those intermediary, um, multiple of those intermediaries. Each intermediary might, um, um, might transform that request. And if they transform it, then they will, uh, they will create their own JOT and include whatever JOT they received from the previous intermediary and forward it to the next, the next one. So that's the, the third use case. Um, so, how do we want to kind of what what the the, the draft is proposing a, a way to kind of uh, get this going? So, the first one is to uh, define a, a content um, type header, a new one, uh, to indicate that the, the nested job will, uh, the the outer job will have its own claims uh, on, and complies to this. So, and and su one suggestion is to call it an uh, eng job, right, for nested job. And then um, we define a new claim inside uh, inside that jot, and we could call it a n jot again. And here's an example of how would that look like. Um, you have a, a, the, a, the CTY at the top here, and you have the nested jot here in, in the payload. So it's really simple, not really <laughs> nothing complex here, uh, but it's useful in in. Uh, in a bunch of a few cases. So questions, uh, or if uh, if people think we uh, we are ready to adopt this, I think some people are in line here. Uh, okay. okay. Brian, did you did you want to say something? 
Mike is is has a question maybe or something. Annabelle was first in the Annabelle queue. Yes. Okay, Annabelle, go ahead, Annabelle. Do we, so. do, do we have somebody managing the queue or tracking the queue? Uh, that, that would be me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, so Annabelle Backman, Amazon. Um, <clears throat> I, I, so I understand the, the the use cases that you laid out. Uh, I, I definitely get why someone would want to uh, nest a, a jot within another jot. What I'm not clear on is the the value of defining a specific claim uh, that that says essentially that, that that really is just stating the type of its value that. You know the 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 n jot claim is is the only thing that tells me is that the value of this claim is a nested jot, but it doesn't tell me anything about what that value means or what it what it represents, which is not really what we use claims for, right? Like is the is is describing the value, you know, the the, the nature of the value. It's a subject. It's not string. It's sub. It's subject. Um, and I, I, I guess in one of the examples you mentioned earlier, I think the stir use case uh, it was all actually noted that that group, the, the people working on that, have gone and defined their own claim. I would expect that's what most people, what most use cases would want to do, because you'd want a claim that indicates some semantics to it. And in some cases, you may actually need to nest multiple jots. Same, you know, in the same jot, in which case this one claim no longer really makes sense. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I, I want to step back and understand the the specific problem of you know the, here that we're that we're really trying to solve. If there's if there's a need to kind of formalize some semantics around or syntax around how you should embed a jot. As the value of a claim, then you know maybe that's something we could talk about. Maybe there's room for for a, a standard or a BCP there, um, but I, I don't see the value of just a, a stock and jot nested jot claim itself. So, so your your objection to to the this claim here, right? Um, I specifically, I, I guess that my objection is sort of to the. The the idea of a general purpose claim for representing a nested jot uh, absent any kind of semantics or or meaning attached to that. Okay. Okay. Next. Uh, so the next person was Mike Jones. Hey, Mike. Hi. Um, <clears throat> first, I'll say that I haven't thought about this for a bit. Um, I think naming would be clearer if we don't try to reuse just a jot, jot term, because that already has a well-defined meaning in the jot spec. And this is not that. It's related, but it's different. So if this goes forward, I would request that we stop using the nested word. Use a word like enclosed or included or jot claim, jot valued claim, something that says what it is. Um, and, you know, in the introduction, you could describe the relationship between nested jots and this, where in a nested jot, the jot itself is the payload, where in this case, the jot itself is a claim of another jot. Yeah, okay. And I do support us trying to grapple with Annabelle's question about is defining a syntax necessary or sufficient or a clear passport example, do you actually want to know what are the semantics of this? Yeah. Something to think about for sure. I'm not presupposing either answer, but I 
take it into the question. Somebody is typing in the back. If you, if you, thank, thanks, Mike. Yeah. Brian? That was me typing. I'm sorry. I forgot I was waiting on cue. Um, so I got a few comments going to pile on a little bit to what was said, but uh, bear with me while I run through these. One would be the second, the, the differentiation between calling it nested and something else, um, because nested was designed for a, a very different sort of purpose, allowing for signed and encrypted jots together and the name better for better or worse the name has taken on that connotation um, and along the same lines i think it might not be appropriate to call that a limitation as you've been describing it so much as just the reality of how that particular construct works um, it was designed specifically to do that to allow for signing and encryption um, so it's maybe a little bit too far to say it's something that a limitation of that it, it did exactly what it was supposed to do um yeah okay fair enough um it doesn't you know it doesn't accommodate what you're doing here but maybe maybe it's something that was missing or i don't, I don't know um I, I along i i'm not sure i i sort of agree with annabelle's comment about sort of application specific needs but also recognize that there's maybe some value in you know, having a common defined name where this kind of um, in, <laughs> the problem is I don't know what to call it included encapsulated jot goes um, so I can kind of see some both sides of that but it's worth considering more one area that I'm I'm really struggling with the need for as well as the way it's been done is the content type here um, noting for example like the the passport diverted piece that you mentioned as a use case, they don't, they don't use any kind of content type to, to distinguish the actual content of the jot itself. So in one real world case, it's not needed. And in just in general, I struggle with why, why you would need a content type to indicate particular claim content in, in the claims themselves. Like we don't, have a content type to indicate that there's a sub or a, a audience or other various sort of components of it. In fact, I don't think there's even a content type to say this is a claim set itself. Um, so it, it, it's feeling like it's, um, I don't know, I, I, it doesn't seem necessary to me. And the only reason I provided this is that um, I want in the nest. Because I, I use the nested jot concept and the nested jot as it as it it, is, uh, it, it has that that um, um, definition that the uh, the payload will contain only the nested jot. This was meant to say, hey, the payload will have the nested jot, but it will have its own claims too. But I, I, and and if we if we move to a different name that we might not need this, but but yeah, it's open for discussion on, on exactly how to do that. Uh, I'm not I'm not stuck on on a specific way. I, uh, it's just want to solve the problem, right? Yeah. Well, just for kind of taking it back then to that example, or trying to borrow from how that works, the content type in that context is really useful for for processing because as you're rolling through processing the sort of the, the crypto layer of the jots, you're able to look at the content type and determine whether needs to be further processed, like check the signature and so forth, or whether to expect that there's actually claims inside here, where this is, it's sort of a different use case where I think all the semantics and sort of understanding of what needs to be done are really defined at the claim level. You, you understand that there's a nested jot by virtue of encountering the nested jot claim. So I, I guess I would say if we do, proceed with this at all or even in the draft itself. I don't think the content type's necessary and it only, only maybe potentially confuses the issue. Not to mention yeah. it also is supposed to be a media type. So um yeah I'm uh, again I'm I'm not I'm not really hung up on, on this. Okay. Just, uh, I we we it's up up to for, for discussion absolutely. So not nothing 
it's just a draft, the initial thing to start the discussion. But yeah, if, if we need to change it and remove it, I, I'll be fine with that. Uh, Tony. So, um, I agree with the, the need for this. We're having some, some of this discussion over in the mobile driver's license um, area. And we have a need for these um, nested claims as far as um, proof presentations are concerned. And we need to have some form of claim aggregation and yet have some tracing of separate, separated claims. So this gives us basically what we want for the, you know, for the mobile driver's license. I do share some concerns over the naming of this and and do we need a separate thing on this but that i think the um use case goes you know beyond what you're what you presented as far as passports because we can we can get into a lot of them as far as the mobile driver's licenses are concerned i think george is next no annabelle sorry annabelle. you again yeah. Um, so yeah, re regarding the the naming thing, I yeah I, I agree with the concerns have been raised. There one, I an idea I want to throw out for that. If you know if this work moves forward, one way to think of this is is it that we're if we're describing this outer jot itself, it's playing an envelope role. So maybe that's a, that's a way to think about the naming here is um, describing. You know, not you know, not you know, the nested jot term kind of re refers to the the thing inside. But if we want to describe what the thing outside is, it's really it's not a nested jot. It's an envelope around some payload that is a jot. Um, so food for thought there, um, Tony. I'm I'm curious on on the use case that you you just raised since you're uh, saying you see a need for this. Um, I, I'm wondering what what you see that's missing today in terms of you know being able to embed a jot within a jot as a claim and uh, subjects, some rules around that. Multiple subjects and other things that need to need to be defined. As far as how does the the subject in the outer jot ref relate or not to the subject of the inner jot? Well, wouldn't wouldn't that be use case dependent? Like, I I would think the the requirements there for mobile for driver's state, licenses yeah. would be different from those for for yeah, say yeah. other use cases. It may or may not be, but we're looking right. for a, a a standard way to do this, so yeah. or a well defined way to do this, uh -huh. um, and so that we can track back backwards yeah. for this for the mobile drives. So that's you know our basic use case over in the. MDL, uh -huh. MDL area. Yeah, I guess that the thing I would like to see, uh, and I, maybe this is an exercise for 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 the authors here, figure out it, in in these use cases what what is there that really is generalizable uh, in in terms of you know those kinds of semantics. Uh, is, is it the case really that there's um, kind of a a general problem to solve of how we relate this you know outer jots claims to the inner jots claims or is there so much variation between use cases there that you know, it would, it's really best to leave that to individual drafts to sort out as they need um, that's yeah I, I, I'd like to see some clarity there um, in order to I guess ju justify having a spec specifically for this. This Jared, can I jump in and are you saying like a um, refers to, so theoretically what does the nested or the, the child jot have to be included or can it just be a reference to? And then if you need that parent jot, you go look it up. Uh, that's an extra load on, you know, call, but do we always need all of the jots included in the single payload? I guess it depends. It depends on the use case, but uh, I could see like you, 
instead OIDC defined something OIDC defined something like that for um for for was it ag not aggregated claims the other one distributed claims um so it, it the idea is not unprecedented let's stick with the queue because otherwise um we we'll never get through this uh uh george you were next and yeah so just I sort of wanted to echo some of Annabelle's comments. I definitely think we have issues with how do we support multiple of these enclosed jots. And it seems to me that from a semantic perspective, if I'm designing a protocol, and I think this is where Annabelle was going as well, right? The individual spec for STIR or for mobile driver's license or whatever, could define a claim name, and the type of that claim name is an enclosed jot. But unless there is some way that we're binding all those enclosed jots into the, let's say, the overall signature of the outer jot, outside of just the fact that they're present in the body, I, I struggle to see where um, we're adding substantial value, right? And I think this gets to the, the higher level sort of general question that Annabelle was posing as well. Because um, for me, I looked at all of those use cases, and I would just define a claim, you know, you know whether that's OPID or OPJOT or whatever is my claim name for that particular interoperable spec, right? And say the type of that claim is a JOT, and you're sort of done, right? Unless we add some additional, you know, security binding or other mechanisms on top of it. We're running out of time very quickly here, so um, maybe we can cut the mic here, um, Anis, and, and let Mike and Phil chime in here. Yeah, yeah it's uh, probably best, uh, a lot of feedback. Uh, Mike? Yeah, I wanted to support the comment that I don't think new content type is warranted. In fact, the content type, it's normally something that would apply to the whole body where this is kind of odd and then it's saying that it's talking about the value of one of the claims being present. So I would just delete the content type. And I think the question is, do we have a generic enclosed JOT claim or do we do as aggregated claims do and as Passport does to have claims that also have a semantic meaning where they have jots as values. And, you know, I certainly support Tony's mobile driver's license use case. Do you question whether the mobile driver's license spec doesn't want to define its own claim saying this enclosed jot has this particular meaning as opposed to just there is an enclosed jot. And again, I'm not presuming an answer. I'm just asking a question. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Phil, last. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. I just, to, going to Mike's term about closed versus a nested, one of the things that struck me that might be interesting, not saying it's actually useful, is that nested suggests that a nested jot, I'll have another nested jot, would bring out these like a chain. and a, and you'd have a block kind of feature. Um, I don't know if there's a use case for that, but that would be one of the big differences. And I don't know if that's a lot of trouble, but that was just one of the things that struck me by the term. Yeah. It was the suggestion that you described, Rifat, that, that as you were going through network layers, each layer might be adding another wraparound to the previous, to the original token and adding a new layer that later pulled apart and analyzed. Yeah. Um, the second thing I'll make is that typing might make things complex to suggest that you're going to get these things random and need to know how to process. I think in a lot of cases, context is everything. So you know what, you, what the possibilities are. And so I wouldn't get too hung up on time, but that's, I don't want to get into that debate too much. But but I do see a lot of possibility there and a lot of use for it. Um, just not sure how far to lock it down for uh, 
George's comments as well. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. And and the the, the nested jaw um, concept that you you mentioned here is I think this is the NSM use case. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hannes. Uh, yeah, I would I would say lots of good feedback. Uh, yeah. Um, I I believe it would make sense to take some some of that feedback on board and produce spin a new document and then we can. Uh, um, we can post a mail to the list to see whether there's a, a, um, a chance for a call for adoption. Um, I heard a couple of uh, detailed uh, comments on some of the design aspects, um, which I think can be clarified and uh, maybe some other use cases covered. Um, and yeah. yeah, I think fair. And and uh, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll work with Anthony or uh, Tony if. Um, because he has another use case, maybe I'll I'll, I'll work with, with Tony offline and see if uh, we can incorporate that use case and work on this together. We'll see. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Switching over to the next presentation. Uh, can you can you do that, Rifat? Um, uh, Vittorio, do you want me to share? Or do you want to share? Um, I'll try to share, and then uh, if it doesn't work, uh, you can share. Fine. Go ahead. Yeah. Let's see if the Mac lets me. Can you guys see my fantastic screen? Yes, of yes, course. Works. It is fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Good morning or good evening, depending on your time zone. Thank you for attending this update. This update is about the profile for using JWT in access tokens for off 2 Just to remind everyone what this is all about. This is an attempt to create something interoperable. Uh, we know that the JWT is already a mainstream option for issuing access tokens for many commercial uh, authorization servers. And uh, um, basically what we did in this profile was to identify claims that uh, reoccur very often in those implementations that are used for uh, well-known functionalities such as validating the token, um, conveying authorization information, sometimes conveying identity information, and uh, basically created a layout which reflects uh, this. And uh, we had quite a lot of discussions about this. We also created uh, a mechanism for advertising keys, uh, issued values, all the things that are typically used for validating a JWT. And we established uh, rules of engagements for uh, retrieving those keys and using them. And uh, um, we also defined a, uh, detailed steps that can be used for validating the claims that uh, we defined as required and for uh, uh, checking signatures. Uh, we added detailed security and privacy considerations given that although this spec doesn't add anything that could not be done before, we do have more information in respect to the baseline of case, and in particular, we know that JWT is a format that is visible from the requester. And so there are some considerations that need to be done in here. And also given that we explicitly call out some identity information, of course, we needed to specify something in terms of uh, privacy. And uh, um, right now, there is a, a very strong correlation between the way in which the token is requested and uh, the values that end up the token being issued. This is one of the open matters, and so I won't go into the details here. But anyway, this is a quick summary. Hopefully, all of you guys were already familiar with this, so I just wasted your time. Then we uh, issued a last call on March 23rd, and it was on version 04, and that triggered a number of uh, really good, good reviews and suggestions. The heroes here are uh, Annabelle, George, Aaron, and others. Thank you guys for your very detailed uh, reviews and your suggestions, and Brian before them. And uh, here are the major changes that occurred inside the spec document since uh, the uh, since the last call. There were a number of clarifications, such as, for example, the exact behavior that we expect from. Uh, EMR, SAR of time, and IAT. And I didn't classify these as normative changes because uh, it was just like the language that wasn't particularly clear, but uh, uh, the intent was already there. Uh, 
I clarify the vector uh, when any of the validation steps uh, in the token validation phase. We need to go for a valid token. Uh, Annabelle made an excellent point that was already done on the call on other spec comments about the fact that it's pointless to use the different keys for signing a token and access tokens. Given that uh, we don't have a mechanism for declaring which key is used for which flavor of token, and so the resource server cannot really distinguish between those two. And so compromising any of the keys in there is enough to compromise everything else. So we clarified that. And then uh, I, uh, I just lifted verbatim, the almost verbatim, the validation steps from OpenID Connect, uh, which had the numbers. But as it turns out, those numbers were just for layout purposes. There was uh, no security intent behind them. And so those have been turned into a list so that people don't think like they must follow a sequence. In terms of normative changes, uh, I add the seventh step in there, which again was coming from uh, the ID token validation uh, heuristics. And uh, um, it was confusing. And also it created a problem because like we were just saying, well, you got to re-authenticate, but we weren't really providing any mechanism for uh, telling the client that they need to authenticate. And so uh, by eliminating that entry, we killed the two birds with one stone. We no longer have a confusing step, which over index on the off time versus other authorization information. And we don't have the problem of defining that mechanism. I think we should, as a working group, define that mechanism, but this spec is not the right place. And also, like there was an enormous amount of cleanup, like uh, really, really, Lots of uh, typos, uh, improper abbreviations. So bigger cleanup. Thanks again for the people that gave feedback. Now the open questions. Uh, the first uh, easy one is uh, should we, um, and actually for all of them, I have slides. So don't jump on it too quickly. Um, for the first one, is simple. Like uh, JWTI, IAT, some people think it should be required. I happen to be among them, but before, Switching that, I just want to hear what the consensus of a Borg cube is. Uh, the other part, which is like a big uh, hot topic, is uh, the fact that the spec is super strict about uh, number of resources in the request, uh, number of resources that end up in the audience. And uh, um, some people don't like how strict that is. And so I'll give you a quick justification of why that is the case, and then uh, we can see uh, what we can do about it. I'm open to relax the uh, language, but I just wanted to do a last ditch attempt. And then we got to two uh, recent comments, one about the fact that uh, apparently the profile doesn't define enough of a profile. And so here I'd uh, ask basically uh, what is missing, if there is something that is missing in terms of uh, defining the layout. And the other part is like a general considerations about privacy. I put it in quotes because it's like a catch all term. So without further ado, let me go to the first one. And here the matter is easy. Should we switch those, those guys from um, recommended to required? No one has an opinion. Everyone has an opinion. We're not seeing your uh, first suggestion slide, Vittorio. You are not seeing my uh, my slides. No, I am. I am seeing his slide. We do. Oh, I'm seeing it. Okay. All I see is working group slide. last call. No. So, which slide are you guys seeing right now? The JTI IATB required. Yes, that is the one that is meant to be shown. You may have to restart your uh, WebEx. It, it happens a lot. And, uh, who, when you say you, you mean me, or you mean the people that don't see the slides? Oh, not you. <laughs> the people. You're fine, you. Victoria. Whoever's it's whoever's not seeing the slides, their system is in error. Thank you. Annabelle Backman, I jumped into the queue. Uh, in the midst of this slide discussion. Um, I totally support 
making JTI and IAT required a hundred percent. This is a good opportunity for that. I don't see any reason why you a an AS would not be able to include them, uh, and they provide significant value uh, for you know, minimal cost. Thank you, Anna. Okay, Dick. Good you, Dick. Can't hear me. Now we can. Now we can. Can hear me. I think they should be required. Yeah. I think let's let's get them in there. There's no downside of having them in. All right. Yeah. Me as a vote for they should be required. This is fantastic. That's great. This is Roman speaking. Maybe we can ask it the other way. Is there anyone that doesn't feel that they should be required? Thank you. That's a good. Uh, that's a good flip. All right. Okay. Yeah, I think you have your feedback, Victoria. That's wonderful. Thank you. Excellent. Not a complicated one. So the reason for which today. There is a strong language, and in the next slide, I have the language that we currently have. Is uh, um, like basically like this thing boils down to today. The spec requires actually, you know what? Let me just show the language. Uh, today, the spec requires that uh, when a requester specifies a resource, specifies and and there are scopes. Like if you are making a request and you are requesting uh, one resource and scopes or a list of scopes that uh, you have only one resource and that all the scopes that you are requesting are relevant to that resource. Or if you are asking for multiple scopes that vote and no resource, for example, all the scopes uh, refer to only one resource. And uh, the reason, and like just to uh, show graphically what the security considerations say, is uh, to prevent the situation that we have in here. Here you have two APIs, and uh, both APIs declare scopes that are valid for them. And uh, if you have multiple uh, uh, resources in the request, say that I ask for both of those APIs, and say that there is one common claim, a uh, common uh, uh, scope between those, then you would end up in a situation in which your token would be ambiguous. Let's say that uh, you wouldn't know whether the scope read applies to, API, to the first API, to the second API, to both. Now, we had a long discussion in the, in the uh, fuck, sorry, my English is not great today. Um, we had a long discussion on the list about uh, mitigations, and it's true that potentially you can do scope stuffing, like you can have, uh, instead of read, you could have uh, a scope which is clearly referring to one particular API. The complication there is that uh, when you are running a system where you have many, 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 many potential APIs, like a multi-tenant system and similar, then typically the identifiers that you end up using end up being pretty large. And then having scopes that contain identifiers, so the naive brute force solution, is just hard. Let's say that you have really a lot of stuff. You end up with tokens that are very large. And defining a mechanism in here for tying scopes to resources like little tables, I think it goes well beyond the scope of the interop profile. Let's say that, uh, of course, I didn't pull all the possible uh, systems, but of all the JWTs that I observed in the wild, no one had anything re even remotely to that level of sophistication. So that's why today we have that language. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is not a kill. I'm willing to die on. So if uh, you guys are compact in uh, pushing back and saying, no, this thing is too restrictive, just turn it into a security consideration in which you warn people against the possibility of this uh, scope confusion, then I'll do it as long as uh, there is enough, I would say, popular support for that. But I think it's a lost opportunity because uh, I observe so much abuse of scopes out there. And I think that if we would have given a bit more guidance, 
then uh, we could have uh, made people develop systems which are, uh, I like to say, better designed. But anyway, I, I'm starting to ramble, so I'll just uh, open to your comments. Thank you. Annabelle first. Um, so, yeah, thanks for bringing this topic back up. I know we've talked a lot about it. Um, I, I think w the language in the current draft is um, uh, is trying to block or, or, or stop uh, this confusion between you know, scope and resource mismatch uh, by prohibiting a specific behavior or a specific scenario that may or may not lead to that. Um, and I don't think we need to do that. I think uh, the a, a more a more uh, uh, broadly applicable approach would be for us to explicitly call out what we're trying to block. And I suggested some language on the list for that that I'll quickly read here because it's one sentence. That uh, the AS must not issue a JOT access token if the authorization granted by the token would be ambiguous. And then we can have some security considerations that explain scenarios where that might come up or what that means or why that would be a problem. Um, I think there's there's a lot of different ways, and I listed some of them on the list. People can look at the mail archive for that, um, uh, for where you may have multiple resources and multiple scopes or multiple resources and no scopes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot of use cases that are where, where we should be able to use JOT access tokens for those. Um, and, and we have to remember as we look at examples out there in the wild that if you're just looking at the people using JOT access tokens today, um, that's only a subset, right? There's there's going to be a lot of people out there who aren't using JOT access tokens because there's no standard for it, right? There's no spec for it. Um, or who might be using JOT access tokens, but you don't know that because you, know, you can't inspect them. Um, so let's, uh, yeah, we should be careful not to over-index on those on those particular uh, use cases. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Amber. This is um, this is good feedback, and uh, I agree. Uh, of course, with the spirit, like uh, I'd like to these to be as applicable as uh, as broadly useful as possible, and I, I also agree with the spirit of saying, uh, don't issue a token if uh, doing so would lead to ambiguity. The thing that I'm always a bit concerned is uh, leaving exercise to a reader or like the math syndrome. As in, like, uh, this spec uh, margin is uh, too small to contain the actual guidance. So you figure it out when it's ambiguous or not. And in an ideal world, that would work. But like, uh, a lot of people aren't ultra deep or aren't as deep as us. And so the attempt that I was doing here was like, uh, and, uh, Admittedly, you're right, I was over indexing on my own personal experience in uh, running uh, such a service and the uh, typical mistakes that people were doing. So I'm perfectly open to change the language to uh, state, uh, like uh, rather than uh, depicting one particular scenario where this happens, just saying, uh, here is an outcome that you don't want to, uh, to ever produce and then add a bit of details in the security consideration. That's my, that's my current position. Yeah, I, I, I think the reality is that like, the AS has to be doing this anyway, right? Like, if the AS is getting a request that has multiple resources and multiple scopes in it, they better understand how to uh, you know, interpret that in order to properly you know, present consent and what. And maybe their use case doesn't doesn't need that, but generally speaking, like the AS better understand what is it's being asked to grant authorization for, right? So, so I, I think to some extent that that there the work is already on their plate, but we can help them with security considerations uh, there. The the one last point I'll make you talk about um, missed opportunity. I think the real opportunity for this work is what we'll talk about in the next meeting, and that's rich uh, authorization requests. I think that's our opportunity to provide the strongly you know, semantic uh, way to specify what you're accessing or what you're what you're requesting authorization for, and from 
which you know endpoints, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and at that point, you know, we probably are going to want to be able to support multiple resources in uh, JOT access tokens. And so, if you have language here that prohibits that, then you know, how does how does that work going forward? That's also a good point. Thank you, Anba. This is very. Th then thanks for all your work on this. this. Is great work. I'm really happy to see it going forward. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? I don't see the field because of the. I'm Georgia. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm next. Um, so uh, again, yes. Thank you, uh, Vittorio. And I guess because I wanted to echo a little bit Annabelle's point in regards to there probably are a lot of other deployment mechanisms that weren't seen in the sense of like, here's the public people who are using a JWT for an access token. Um, and so there are probably valid deployment models that don't use, you know, the exact mechanisms here. I, I don't have a problem with using recommended language as opposed to required for some of these things. Either if we want to sort of like say, put a little bit of a, here's a recommended way to approach scopes, right? To help people who are doing it for the very first time. Um, I do think whether it's RAR or some other best practice, there is a lot of value to describing, here's a set of models for how to deal with scopes and resources and audiences that are you know, deemed to be best practice models. And that would be a whole separate doc, right? Um, that would be a more along the best practice kind of a thing where we could then dig into the, the relationships between these things and how do people do it the right way. Um, I just feel like right now we'd be, we'd either be forcing people to create values that are pretty much meaningless in order to meet the requirements of the spec. Um, if we continued with the way it is now. Um, and, and I don't know that that adds value. Um, so I, I guess my recommendation would be, um, you know, maybe we describe a sort of like one possibility of a good practice in the doc and use recommend recommended language, right? Which doesn't prohibit these other use cases that we either know about in the wild today or that are coming. And, you know, if we want to as an organ, you know, as a group, we can tackle the larger issue of, you know, what is a good way to deal with scopes? Because if you're a small, you know, a small site running something, you could easily use per API kind of scopes because you may not have that many or you could turn them into sets. Right. And it's a perfectly valid deployment model. Right. If you're a multi-tenant enterprise as a, you know, identity as a service entity, right? Yeah, that may not be a viable option. Um, so anyway, just some thoughts there. That's great. Thank you, George. That's, um, that's great. I also really like the mention of the fact that uh, if we really want to go after practices, perhaps these uh, deserve its own document where we have uh, room to explore those relationships as opposed to just somewhat try to smuggle it in here where the the purpose of a document uh, is different. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, it's empty. Go on. All right, very exciting. So, summary, I'm going to go back to our uh, fantastic spec. I'm going to look at some of the adjusted language and I'm going to uh, do an update and that along the lines of what we just said, which is either going toward the recommended or just uh, having uh, in the uh, security consideration something. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so the other matter that we had was uh, um, the fact that uh, um, Dennis in particular mentioned that uh, uh, the uh, profile layout, like it, it finds strange that the spec doesn't provide uh, a profile layout. And uh, actually, my impression is that we do, let's say that uh, we define the uh, planes that carry the information that we need to carry. And uh, then we just uh, give guidance about how people can extend it in the way that makes sense for that scenario. But uh, even so, the, here my position is I think that we do have a, a layout. And I don't think that we can def uh, make it more defined at this point unless uh, there are specific concepts that are missing. Let's say that uh, I don't think it makes sense to tell people you can't add your own claims, for example, or uh, 
making everything mandatory. Like there are some things that are optional for good reasons because uh, we don't think that uh, they should always be used. So basically the question is, uh, is there anything missing from the current layout that we should add? The problem is that there are parameters that are mandatory. All right, sorry. They should sorry. be optional. Sorry, who's speaking? Who is speaking? Yeah, can you please get in, into the queue, like add, add yourself okay. to the queue? Uh, Brian, you're first. I was jumping on too late for the last topic and okay. uh, maybe just indulge me for a minute before we come back to this. You had in a, a much earlier slide that you clarified the meaning of uh, off time ACR AMR. And I, I was trying to look at the, the diff for this and it looks like the clarification was actually just removing a bunch of texts explaining it and I, I'm struggling a little bit with how that helps it I actually sort of liked the the text that tried to at least put some constraints on what those meant to be something that was meaningful in the world of an access token um and now it, unless I'm reading it wrong it just defers to OIDC with no further context um can, uh, are you done can I answer or do you want to add something more Brian just rambling at that point so if you could shed some light on or at least clarify for me what's going on there that yes go please please so here there is a um there is one uh, one issue which is uh, i did i skipped one uh itf and so some of the work that went uh, in clarifying off time amr acr happened before the last call and uh, some of that was actually uh including uh feedback from you and from Annabelle. And uh, what happened was that uh, a lot of the things that were inside the, um, the description was of each claim was uh, actually uh, placed forward in the first paragraph. And then basically each description were basically echoing it with a slightly different language, the one, that, the language that was uh, in that first paragraph. And so, um, Annabelle made the first uh, suggestion to get rid of it, and I didn't. And then she repeated the suggestion later on. And then at that point, I just looked at this and I saw that she did have a point, and so I eliminated it. So the reason for which you say clarification is in here, but the, re the only thing that you see after the last call is the deletion, is that uh, there was a bit more of discussion that occurred before the last call, and that uh, um, did have effect uh, is in uh, changing the language, so actual clarification. So, so we have one more minute here, just to let Dennis uh, chime in here. Go ahead, Dennis. Thanks. Dennis. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Dennis. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Well, all my concerns are related to privacy issues. And uh, first of all, I observed that there was problem uh, with properties which are called untraceability, unlockability, and data minimization. And basically, the protocol has been described is unable to support these three privacy properties. Uh, I started with untraceability, where basically the authorization server is able to know exactly where the token will be used and then is able to act as big brother. The second point is that, uh, in fact, uh, there are two parameters that are mandatory, sub and client ID. And I sent an email just a quarter of, uh, well, just before this meeting, less than one an hour ago. Since these two parameters are required, it's impossible to support data minimization. And then you have the problem that servers can link the tokens from different clients, which is not very good when you want to support privacy. So basically, uh, my observation is that the current profile is unable to support good privacy principle. And this should be indicated in the privacy consideration section. And uh, another detail, which there is a must not in the privacy consideration section, I think that client should be able to inspect the content of the token, because if they want to be confident that the content is correct, they should be able to do that. 
Um, Rifat, do I have time to answer, or does he? Yeah, his, maybe uh, one, maybe a sentence or two, if you if you want, and uh, otherwise we'll have. He to brought up four points. I think I needed to mention those four points. Okay. So on the uh, not no like uh, on the uh, privacy principles, the general point is uh, I don't think that here we are adding anything that isn't already in off, and so I don't think that uh, placing goals uh, for this particular spec that are. Uh, somewhat higher or different than the entire framework is appropriate. From the point of view of uh, knowing where the token is going, RFC 6750 explicitly say that it's important for the authorization server to include the identity of intended recipient, typically single resource server or list of resource servers in the token. So here we are following best practices that are described by an RFC in using tokens. The fact that these tokens as a particular format doesn't change the goal of a token, in my opinion. And the same goes for resource indicators. For what concern the, the collusion with the sub, there are other mechanisms that are not about the, con the presence of a sub, but the content. So you can use a PPID, you can use directed identifiers if you want to prevent uh, APIs from uh, correlating uh, different tokens. It's just a matter of what the authorization server decides to place in the sub. The sub doesn't have to be the same for API 1 and API 2. For what concern the client inspecting the content of the access token, that's just an uh, architectural uh, mistake. Let's say that uh, the fact that I'm using a JWT doesn't change anything in terms of how the information flows between the authorization server and the resource server. The access token remains an artifact meant to gain access to the resource server. The content is a matter between the resource server and the authorization server. And uh, if, even if I can look inside the token, there is no guarantee that I will keep being able to look, that I will understand what I see, that what I see is in a format that I can parse. But we can keep on with a discussion on, uh, on the list on these two particular points. But uh, just to make my position clear, right now, I'm not convinced at all that was to our problem. Okay, Th thank you, Vittorio. I think this concludes our meeting today. So, um, uh, like we, we don't have time, we, we uh, our time already. Thanks, thanks, Vittorio, and we will meet next week, guys. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.